Welcome, everyone. Thank you for those introductions. Um, <clears throat> it's an honor and feeling very grateful to be here with all of you tonight. And uh, as you heard, I'm filling in tonight for Eve and Chandra, really a sign of the times of kind of what we're doing here right now, navigating the pandemic and also embracing this hybrid model of the Dharma Collective. So sometimes we're all together, sometimes uh, there's people online and the teachers in person, and sometimes tonight, like tonight, uh, teacher is virtual. Uh, and then we have people that are in the space and online. So uh, it's, uh, a lot of gratitude that we're able to kind of meet in this very unique way. Um, so uh, for those of you that I have not met, see a lot of familiar faces. I think, you know, this is also another amazing thing about the Dharma Collective is that I get to sit with you all as kind of a student and participant and teach. Um, so really be a part of the Sangha in multiple ways. Um, so for those of you, um, if we're just meeting for the first time tonight, Tig. Uh, I'm a contemplative artist and a meditation teacher. I teach mindfulness and emotional balance classes and courses in hospitals and universities. I'm currently focusing on a research study at the Mindfulness Center at Brown. Uh, we're developing a mindfulness course that's adapted for young gay men and uh, to support their well being and sexual health of that community. I teach mindfulness based stress reduction and as many of you are familiar through Sitting with Eve, a program called Cultivating Emotional Balance. Um, I also lived in a Tibetan monastery in Nepal. Uh, so kind of draw on both my secular training and more traditional lineages. Um, as an artist, I create large scale earth art on beaches um, that are mandalas and labyrinths. Um, that kind of weave together contemplative themes. So it's kind of this merging of art and meditation. And I teach at Pratt Institute, which is a design school in New York City, uh, where I teach a mandala meditation course, which I'm very excited um, to announce that I'll be teaching this course on uh, mandala meditation at the Dharma Collective. So more to come on that uh, after the session, I'll talk a little bit about so that's just a little bit about me. Um, we talked a little bit about the center and I just wanted to kind of um, pause for a moment here and just mention the importance of Sangha and the feeling of support uh, and connection of being with community. One of the things that I love about the Dharma Collective is how welcoming it is, the inclusivity, um, the intention set to kind of keep the doors open, especially during the pandemic. So with that, let's just pause for a moment, just for a few seconds and feel what it's like to be here together. If you're online, maybe just taking a look at everyone else. And if you're together, maybe just looking around the room, maybe you wanna close your eyes and just for a brief second, feel what it's like to be here with community. whether in the physical space or in the digital realm, you are not alone. The community is here supporting, practicing right next to you. And how does that feel? And if you had closed your eyes, you're turning back to open eyes. Thank you for that brief moment, just to kind of feel and set that container of community and Sangha here. So tonight uh, we have a, a mix of practice time and discussion. Uh, we'll be continuing the exploration of um, the book on the path to enlightenment, uh, heart advice from the great Tibetan masters, um, which is uh, kind of curated and translated by Matthew Ricard. So no worries if you don't have the book or if you're just joining for the first time tonight, I'm gonna to keep this um, more about practice and discussion um, and less about the actual book itself. So we're continuing with chapter 14, if you are following along, starting on page 195. Um, and so we're gonna continue the theme of view, meditation and action. Um, so I know that Eve and Chandra have already started um, teaching from this chapter. So 
I'm going to refer to it a little bit, um, but really make tonight more about the practice. So view meditation action. Um, at, you know, when I was preparing to uh, teach this class, I was thinking, and I was talking to Noam earlier, that view meditation and action is basically the Dharma. <laughs> it is the foundation of the Buddhist teachings. Um, and I like to think of it kind of as the trifecta, how we see the world, how we practice with it, and how we move about inside of the world. So view of reality, the meditation of practice, and then how we take action and move about the world. Um, and it's really more than a teaching, even more than a practice. It's a way of being both in the inner world and the outer world. So tonight we're gonna focus a bit on view. Um, we're gonna do uh, a little uh, sitting now We'll talk a little bit about view, and then um, we'll have another brief practice, and then we'll share and talk. Uh, <clears throat> so, view, um, how we practice view, you know, really getting into mindfulness and um, being with what is. So, um, for this practice, it's going to be about 25 minutes or so. We're going to be practicing how we're relating to what's happening, um, how the mind is moving, the relationship to our sensory experience. Um, I'll offer a lot of pauses along the way um, to just be with what's happening and investigating how we're experiencing the impermanence and interconnected nature of our thoughts, of our nervous system, of everything that's happening in the environment around us. So we'll start to make a transition into our practice, finding a comfortable posture. We like to remain seated or perhaps lying down, standing up. Maybe you'd like to close the eyes or perhaps lower them down to a surface in front of you and soften the gaze. Maybe there's still movement in the body as we continue transitioning into stillness, taking your time. Allowing the body to settle. Coming into that comfortable posture that allows you to be relaxed, but yet alert and awake. Continue settling in. Let's bring the awareness down to all the points of contact that we're feeling the body making with the support beneath it, whether it's a chair, a floor, or a cushion. And just letting the awareness drop to these areas, perhaps noticing pressure, or hardness, firmness, maybe softness where you might be contacting with a pillow or fabric. Just letting the attention drop out of the thinking mind and down into the feeling body. Feeling that stability, that steadiness rising up to meet the body. Even if the mind is busy right now and moving with thoughts of things that happened earlier today or things that will come after this, still practice finding that steadiness just by feeling into that ground beneath us. Knowing that we're all sharing this ground together, whether in person or virtually, we're all resting on the same ground. Finding that support of the community, the support of the land. And then as we bring the attention up into the body, let's just check that the spinal column is in a straight line with the neck and the head, bringing a sense of vividness into our practice just by bringing a slight lifting through each of the vertebrae. Helping 
cultivate that sense of alertness, vivid attention through finding this posture, whether we're seated or laying down. This posture of a straight neck, head, back. And then let's invite a sense of ease and relaxation into the practice by imagining this wave of relaxation coming down into the body through the crown of the head as it moves through relaxing the muscles of the eyes, allowing any expression on the face to come to neutral, relaxing the jaw, the tongue, and following this downwards through the body, even though the back is straight, we can soften the shoulders, allow them to drop down, the arms become heavy. Checking that the abdomen, the pelvic floor are relaxed, if there's any tension or squeezing, seeing what happens just by bringing the attention to that area. Maybe directing the breath, Finding that sense of ease and letting go of the out breath. Any areas of tension, tightness that don't release, you can soften the mind around those areas just by allowing them to be there, forcing or striving to fix or change anything. And then letting that wave of relaxation move all the way down through the legs and the feet. So here we are resting the body and the mind in their natural state, grounded, vivid, and relaxed. Before we move into the main part of our practice, let's take a moment to set an intention. And an invitation here to reflect on how we want to meet stress or difficulty in our life. So what does that look like, sound like, feel like for you when you meet moments of stress or difficult? How would you like to approach them? Maybe it's a feeling, maybe it's a mantra, perhaps the phrase, this too. Perhaps saying, this makes sense. Maybe it's a sound like, ah. Oh, Maybe it's a feeling in the body. But setting this intention of how you would like to meet difficulty or stress in your life. Maybe a sense of ease, a sense of openness, allowing. And then using that aspiration as an intention for the practice tonight. So as we make a transition into the main part of this practice, let's bring our awareness to the breath. Perhaps noticing the sensations of the breath, maybe the movement of the air through the nostrils. Maybe if it doesn't feel comfortable to come into the body tonight, maybe just resting the awareness just outside the nostrils and feeling the moment that the air enters into the body and then the moment the air exits out. Perhaps for you, you're focusing on the movement in the chest, the rise and fall of the rib cage, the expansion and contraction of the lungs. Perhaps you'd like to rest with the complete cycle of the inhalation and then the exhalation. Just finding an area of the breath that's coming forward most vividly to you in this moment. And beginning to saturate the awareness in this aspect of the breath. Letting the mind mix completely with this experience of breathing, whether it's inside or outside the body.
Noticing how the mind may be moving in this moment. Perhaps it's mixed completely with the sensation of the breath. Maybe you're noticing that it's wandering to thoughts or an awareness of other sensory experiences. And all of that is welcome in this practice. Whenever you do notice that the mind has slipped away from the breath, perhaps calling forth that intention of how you'd like to meet stress and meet the wandering mind with that attitude, with that feeling, that sound. Remembering that in this practice, a wandering mind is never a problem. In fact, it's the practice itself, returning again and again. as much as possible, not thinking about the breath, not visualizing the breath, just resting with the feeling of the breath. Again, no need to change or fix anything, just letting the natural rhythm of the breath expand and contract through the body. Noticing how we may be relating to not just the breath, but the way the mind is moving. There's an analysis or evaluation, maybe even judgment of the practice. And welcoming all of that mental activity. And then returning to the next breath in whenever you're ready. Uh, stay with the sensations in the body, this time starting to expand the awareness beyond just the breath, exploring the sensations and the somatic field first by allowing the awareness to drop down once again into the legs and the feet. And just exploring with a sense of curiosity, the sensations or perhaps even lack of sensation in this area of the body. And remembering that these sensations or lack of sensations are simply an anchor to pay attention to. We're not forcing the mind onto the sensations. We're not striving to feel a certain way just bringing that sense of ease and relaxation into the mind by just noticing sensations of tingling, pulsing, perhaps temperature, pressure. Remembering every time the mind wanders away from the sensations and the legs and the feet to call forward that intention once again of how you'd like to meet stress and meet the wandering mind with that attitude, that mantra, that sounds. And 
and then allowing the mind to mix completely with the sensations in the legs, the feet, the toes. And then on the next in-breath, imagining that you're pulling your awareness up from your legs into the torso, becoming aware of the sensations from the hips and the pelvis all the way through the torso up to the shoulders, perhaps scanning part by part or just resting in an open awareness of this area of the body. Noticing the movement of the breath and the abdomen or the chest. Perhaps there's pleasant or unpleasant sensations in the torso that are coming forward. Maybe it's an awareness of the heart beating in the chest. Just resting the mind here in this part of the body it's noticing the changing nature, the impermanent nature of the sensations. And then letting the awareness expand out through the shoulders and down into the arms and fingers. And then on the next in-breath, pulling the attention up from the torso and the arms into the head. And just taking a moment here, perhaps scanning through different areas of the head and the face, or perhaps just resting with an awareness of this container of the head and all that's happening inside. Let's bring the awareness now to the structure of the ears, the outer ear, the ear lobes, the ear drum. And as we make a transition here from the feelings in the body now to the sense of sound. And if it feels comfortable, letting the awareness rest in the eardrum and allow the sound to come to you. Opening up the awareness and just listening. Perhaps noticing sounds that are steady, consistent other sounds that arise and then disappear on top of that. Perhaps moments of silence in between. And remembering your intention from the start of the practice, whenever the mind slips away from sound, it gets lost in thought or analysis of what you're hearing. You bring forward that intention of how you would like to meet that moment. And then returning to the immersion of the mind into this practice of listening.
relax. <clears throat> Taking a moment to notice if tension has returned into the body, if there's a squeezing or tightening anywhere. And inviting that wave of relaxation once again through the body. Noticing moments of the wandering mind, the body tenses up. Maybe the mind tenses up around that. Remembering the intention to just allow whatever's unfolding in your practice and your sensory experience to be here. Right now, focusing on sound simply as an anchor. Every time the mind wanders away is the opportunity to practice the return, strengthening those pathways to presence, returning again and again to the next sound or the experience of silence. Noticing how we may be relating to what we're hearing or not hearing, how that may trigger thoughts, judgments, preferences. And then returning again and again, just to this practice of listening. Here we'll begin to transition from the sense of sound to the sense of thought. So shifting the awareness from what you're hearing around you to now the landscape of the mind and thoughts. And some may find it helpful to visualize looking at the blue sky and thoughts as clouds floating by. Some may find it supportive to imagine yourself looking at a empty movie screen, thoughts just scrolling by. For a few moments, just being the observer of the mental activity, thoughts as they arise, abide, and then disappear. Just like we were practicing with sound, noticing the thoughts that may be reoccurring constantly. Thoughts that arise and then disappear. The space in between the thoughts. And as much as possible, not cognitively fusing with the thoughts, not thinking the thoughts, just noticing them. You may catch yourself down the rabbit hole of a thought or perhaps the awareness shifting to another sense. Remember that intention of how you'd like to meet stress and infuse that moment of noticing that the mind wandered away with that intention, that mantra, that sound, that feeling in the body. Then returning to the domain of the mind and watching thoughts as they arise and disappear. Perhaps noticing this ever-changing landscape of thinking, of different thoughts, a variety of things to think about that you might be noticing, to-do lists, planning, worrying. It might be helpful to label the thoughts and then let them go.
And we'll make one final transition in our practice, shifting from focusing on thoughts to now just an open awareness, a choiceless awareness. So without trying to control the mind or rest on a specific anchor, just bring a sense of curiosity and openness and allow the mind to move freely. Perhaps it will notice an in-breath and then shift to a sound, which then leads to a thought. Or perhaps it's a sensation in the body that leads you to the feeling of the ground and then the breath and then a sound. So just letting the mind move, leaning back in the mind and being the observer of how it's moving. If this feels confusing or overwhelming at any point, you can always return to the breath or the feeling of the ground beneath the body to stabilize the mind. And if and when you're ready to let go and be the observer of this choiceless awareness. Perhaps zooming out and experiencing a multitude of senses, combining maybe an awareness of sound at the same time as an awareness of the breath. And just noticing again how you may be relating to this moment of practice, the ever changing nature of mind, of the environment, the interconnection of all the things that are unfolding in your experience. How a sensation may lead to a thought, which may lead to a judgment, and then back to the breath. And then as we begin to approach the end of this practice, just taking a moment to check in. Notice if anything has shifted over the past 20 minutes or so. Notice how the mind may be moving, how the body feels. And no expectation, no right or wrong here. Perhaps the mind has slowed, perhaps it's sped up. Perhaps there's a feeling of calm, perhaps there's a sense of agitation. I'm just checking in, taking this internal weather report to see what's here now. And then as we come to an end of this practice, letting go, perhaps following one more breath into the body and then on the exhale, releasing the breath, releasing the practice, taking the time to return back to open eyes if they were closed, making any movement or stretches that would feel supportive to help make this transition to the next moments of our session together. <clears throat> <clears throat> so
So thank you all for practicing. Uh, I'd love to just open up um, here any reflections on what that practice may have been like for you, what arose in your awareness, um, any questions that you may have, anyone wants to share with their intention on how to meet stress and how that kind of wove into your practice, just open up um, and hear what you have to say. <clears throat> Uh, here we go. Oh, uh, hello. Thank you for uh, for this experience. Um, really wonderful to be able to um, meditate in a group. I think it's been a few years. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think this is, uh, it's one of those experiences where you forget how good it feels to be in the same physical space, not to take anything away from Zoom, better than nothing, I suppose. Um, uh, I think what came to mind when I was sitting is how um, when I'm in the same space as other people meditating, it definitely feels like there's an energy in the room. And um, I tried to explain it kind of having this internal dialogue and oftentimes this dialogue is kind of a dialogue with somebody who maybe has not experienced it so if that person is not there <laughs> you know <laughs> that person's not there and I'm having this dialogue and I'm like I don't know how to explain it but it really does feel different and then, and then I realized that no one is debating it. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. My name is Mike, and it's wonderful to be here. Hey, Mike, can I ask a question before you, you go back? Yeah, 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 uh, absolutely. I'll... Thank you for, for sharing that. And I'm just curious, because you were saying, you mentioned it's hard to describe the, with thought. Uh, so I'm curious, how does it? feel how does it feel in the body to be in a room with people to be practicing with people is there a felt experience associated with that mm -hmm. um obviously i can only explain how it feels for me i feel like it it feels like a very gentle wave uh kind of kind of rocking this space uh not i mean rocking is too actually almost too hard of a word that's kind of how it feels for me um today mm. and um just a little maybe for context i started meditating about 12 years ago and uh ended up going to san francisco zen center uh and i was spent a lot of time going there. Went to Tassajara for you know several times volunteering, and I think in that process of going somewhere on a weekly basis, and there was a group, Young Urban Zen, that I was a part of. Um, I got used to that feeling. So just like when you get used to any feeling, you kind of stop appreciating that feeling because it's always there it's like you know um you just get used to 
having a nice mattress, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's your mattress. And then you go somewhere, it's like, oh, wow. It doesn't feel as comfortable. So these last couple of years, I feel like I started appreciating what I had. I know it's this today was like, wow, this is how it feels to be in the middle of a Sangha. This is so awesome. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. That that way you describe the felt experience of being being with community, being practicing with the sangha of a wave. I think that really relates a lot to this uh, idea of interconnection and interdependence. A lot of times, I think of you know the other week Chandra mentioned that um, emptiness is interdependence, and a lot of times I think of interdependence as this wave you know it's it's interconnected and one thing leads to the next that leads to the buildup of the wave and then the cresting and the crashing so i really love the idea that kind of being with community is that sense of connection that where it's you know that analogy that we always hear about like we're all waves of the ocean you know separate but connected so thank you for sharing that's really beautiful thank you Anyone else like to share what came up for them, what that practice was like, or any questions? <clears throat> we have something to share, not mutually, separately. <laughs> um, tonight when you, uh, first of all, I really wanna just say that um, right now, because of like the way the world is, the way my life is, the, he the heavy guidance for me is really helpful. I'm sure that that's not true for everybody, but um, so thank you. Like just like my mind, it helps my mind to be like, <laughs> to have something it can follow like a little puppy dog, um, they say. Um, but tonight when you talked about the thoughts, the mindfulness of thoughts, that's like a sort of one that I've always struggled with a little bit, but it was really interesting because I was doing the like, uh, a friend of mine calls it the the spiritual super ego was like working really hard at doing it right and there was like the thoughts you know of like and then i was like i sat up straighter and kind of ch adjusted my chin and i was like what made me do that and i sort of had in retrospect anyways realized there was like there's these quiet or subtler thoughts that actually aren't necessarily in language but they are thoughts i think there's something there anyway so it was a i tapped into that for a minute or a second is a better way to put it and it was very um it was just like an interesting sensation as it happened like as i sort of realized like oh that's all not the most exciting report but and mates how if i can ask how did that relate to when, when you notice that happening how did that relate to what your intention was for your practice you don't have to share the intention but if you don't feel comfortable with it oh i'm happy like my intention for everything right now is just uh, me, can i meet myself with spaciousness and kindness and can i meet myself can part of the kindness be like healthy boundaries you know right because like my mind wants kindness to be like 40 pints of chocolate ice cream and going on with the fantasy during meditation that's like more entertaining right like that's what it thinks is kind but kind is actually coming back to the practice right but it also the other side of my like the other side of my mind is like wants to come back to the practice by telling me i'm a piece of shit meditator so the intention is like the equanimity point like boundaries and kindness um so it actually felt like that because it was just like this little like curious like oh check that out like it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't yeah it was just simple it was simple curious like a little light touch and then probably another bigger thought that this spiritual superego is constructing came along i love the connection of curiosity with equanimity uh you know m many of us may have heard this idea that um curiosity is the antidote to judgment 
And so kind of weaving that in with how you're experiencing the meditation, you know, and tonight we're talking about this chapter around view, meditation, and action. And so in that meditation, you were practicing the view of equanimity mm. uh, via curiosity, which is super skillful. And, you know, thank you for illustrating that kind of idea of, of, the, um, of the talk tonight. Well, that's pretty cool. And I think my beloved has something to share, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, uh, there was something that you said in the sit that was helpful. I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, but uh, I've been sitting with my system having a lot of anxiety, just like lately, just like anxiety. And um, it's interesting to come like to meditation with that, you know, to be like, oh, here I am. Oh, okay, let's drop it in the body. Oh, right, the diaphragm is contracted. Oh, you know, and like the way you took us through the body too a little bit of like, oh, right, oh, oh, there's the energy in the feet, okay. Oh, oh, right, oh, the kind of in the back too, the energy is contracted, oh. The energy in the kind of this, the head area is kind of contracted. Oh, you know, oh, just like kind of over and over again. Oh, and like how the different places where the energy is in different states exists and the way that I come back to the contracted state as like a focal point. And then also um, being like, okay, I'm actually not going to, I'm not going to try to make this different because this is actually what's happening. Like I'm actually in this condition right now. I'm actually doing, you know, and just sort of like having this observation of like, that this is what's going on and trying to, um, n noticing that there's this other part of me that's like, wants to think that meditation, you know, like this idea, like it's always supposed to be, you're just like supposed to be relaxed and in this blissful state. And, you know, I have had a ton of practice and various conditions arise all the time in it. Um, but this particular condition I want, there's like a, a wanting to fix it, right? There's a habit of wanting to fix it. But then with this sit, it was more like, no, I'm just going to be right here to the you know and then the mind and do, 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 and then come back and just be like i'm not going to try to do anything about this and there was something that you commented in the in the in your in your guiding that also was reinforcing that and i don't know i just thought i'd share that thank you pamela if i may ask a question sure i heard you say the word oh uh, a lot in terms of you're describing what was happening in your practice and it had a very to me I heard it that sound very gentle oh 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 like this is what's happening um, and it allowed you to be with it oh rather than no and so I'm curious how might that relate to life yeah <laughs> Yeah. And I think, you know, it's really about what we're talking about tonight is how our meditation practice supports the view that we are cultivating of the world around us and what's happening in it. So practicing with, oh, I, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but almost, oh, becomes a mantra. Like for me, it's when I meet the wandering mind, I'm like, ah, <laughs> you got the, oh, I got the, ah. Uh, so <laughs> And you know, I know a lot of people find it supportive, the mantra, this too, like, oh, this too, this thought, this sound, this annoying sensation in my knee, like this is welcome too. And so when we talk about this trifecta of view, meditation and action, tonight we're really focusing on view and meditation. What we're hearing through some of these examples is how we meet what's happening in the practice as an analogy for how we view the world, how we move about the world, um, both how we perceive what's happening, but also how we take action and move about it. 
Um, so, you know, Pamela was pointing to that, oh, that allowance. It was a little bit different for Mace, it's a little different for me, but this really illustrates that we can use our practice not just to shape, um, you know, like as Pam, we or Pamela say, it's not just about the relaxation and the bliss and all that kind of stuff. It's about how we're relating to what's happening and that, that really shifts the action that we take from there. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for sharing your insights there. Um, if any other questions or comments are coming up and you're online, please feel free to drop that in the chat and we'll keep an eye on it. Um, Want to talk, to make a transition to talking very briefly about this idea of you um, and, and then we'll, we'll do a, another very short um, meditation. And so I wanted just to kind of bring it back to um, the chapter and just read this opening paragraph. Um, you may have already heard it from previous weeks, but um, so just turning the awareness to this act of listening uh, as you hear these words. View refers to the way one perceives reality. Based on analysis and contemplation, it enables one to understand with certainty that phenomena do not have the solid reality usually attributed to them. Everything is interdependent, impermanent, and devoid of independent existence. It means seeing the nature of mind. So we've, we've just heard a lot of examples of how the mind is moving there. Meditation is the method of gradually assimilating the view by a process of familiarization until it becomes one with one's being. And so this really relates to that invitation to think of that intention. How do we want to meet stress? And then using that aspiration, that intention as how we meet every moment in our meditation practice this process of familiarizing ourselves with what it looks like, sounds like, feels like to meet difficulty in life through how we meet the wandering mind. So we're kind of practicing the view that we want to have. Um, and then continuing on, action is the process of connecting to the world by implementing the experience gained in the view and meditation through one's conduct. So then how do we take that into the world? How do we meet what's actually happening in the world beyond just an aspiration and actually take action? Uh, so it, for example, if we want to meet stress or meet difficulty or, or suffering with compassion, then we meet the wandering mind during our practice with compassion. We meet that pain in our hip with compassion. Uh, and then when we open our eyes and we come out of that, formal practice and kind of into the applied practice of life, we can take action in a compassionate way because we now have these strengthened pathways of repeated over and over in our practice, what it looks like, sounds like, feels like to be compassionate to ourself and what's happening in the practice. So just weaving together these three ideas of view, meditation and action through the intention, through the aspiration that we have, practicing it over and over in our practice. And then it actually becomes second nature when we move out into the world because we have those pathways. We've been, we've been strengthening them through our practice. So as we talk about view, I think, you know, for those of you that have sat with me before, or even just in conversation, I, I talk about, we, we all talk in, in the Dharma about ultimate and relative. Um, the true nature of reality is this kind of the tale of two truths. Um, and so that we view the world as, as these solid objects. I always, if you ever notice, I always do this when I'm talking about reality because it's like our um, nervous system is telling us that we're solid. It's telling us that we're separate. All of our senses are reinforcing this idea that we are solid and independent of each other when that's the relative reality, where the ultimate reality is that we are beyond just connected, we're interconnected, cause and effect, that things are always changing, the impermanence, um, and how this attachment and aversion um, causes so much suffering. Um, so really getting clear on the, the, both the true nature, but also being with the relative nature 
And I love this idea that they're both happening at the same time. They, they both can be true at the same time, but the support that knowing at the ultimate level that we're not seeing things super clearly there. And so an invitation to bring that into your practice. You know, if we've been talking about framing out view, meditation and action with the intention of how we practice, so if our intention is to see more clearly or to operate at a level um, in reality that allows us to uh, not attach or not avert, that we can move a bit more effortlessly through the world. I think it's important that we, to say, we don't negate what's happening by saying, you know, the ultimate versus the relative. We can't just bypass painful experiences by saying, well, I'm not really seeing that clearly. Um, it's important to be able to hold both. Knowing that our nervous system is telling us one thing, but then there's also this kind of greater truth, this greater understanding that we can practice with. That um, knowing that things are fluid, that wave analogy comes back here. Things are fluid, changing, moving, can't grab on. Um, that's, what the that's where the suffering comes from. Um, so just kind of operating at that macro and micro view at the same time. Um, the, the zoomed out 40,000 square feet, but then also knowing what the experience that we're having in this moment is. So I wanna give a, a very short practice here and then open it up to share again, any thoughts on view and meditation action and any sharing that comes up in this practice. So we're really gonna be exploring this kind of view, how we're seeing things um, mistakenly as solid and, and independent. Um, it is gonna be visualization based. So I'm gonna guide um, uh, a practice using imagination. If that's not your thing, if you're not feeling that tonight or visualizing isn't something that resonates with you, you're more than welcome to just think about it. And you can use thoughts as part of the practice and uh, an analysis or using kind of cognition to think about the prompts that I'm offering. So let's bring a, a sense of curiosity and check it out and see what comes up. So perhaps you like to close your eyes, maybe lower them down, soften the gaze. Returning to that sensation of being grounded, connected to the ground beneath you, the vividness through the body, through the posture, helping the wakefulness of the practice, but also that sense of ease and relaxation through the body. And from here, we begin to shift our awareness to either the domain of visualization or perhaps thoughts. And imagining that you can zoom out and come up above the body. If you're in San Francisco, come all the way up into the sky and look down and see the bay. If you're in another area, perhaps imagining what the San Francisco Bay may look like. And from this view at maybe 40 or 50,000 feet up in the air, seeing the city, seeing the bridges spanning the bay, seeing Oakland and Marin and the South Bay, an awareness of the Pacific Ocean. And if you're visualizing, just take a moment to take in the view. And if you're in thoughts, using your cognition of what is this like to know that there's this bay and the city and the ocean around you. And notice how whether what we're visualizing or thinking about appears to be solid. This is the bay that we know. This is the landscape, these are the bridges. They're the geographic features, the topography of the Bay Area. The 
And then for a moment, just recall that at one time, many millions of years ago, the bay was simply a series of small rivers cutting through the land. The shoreline actually extended way out beyond where it is now. And over time, the bay filled with water, these rivers expanded as the ice and snow, the ice age began to melt and filling the basin that we now know as the bay. Whether you're visualizing this happening or just thinking about it, knowing that it's believed that the bay has filled up and emptied out six or seven times over the past millions of years. An ever-changing and dynamic landscape And it will continue to do that. The bay will continue to fill and empty. Perhaps one day, in many millions of years from now, the bay will cover all of San Francisco. Maybe it will empty out again and come back into rivers. Taking a moment, acknowledging whether it's through visualization or thoughts, this impermanence, this ever-changing landscape of the Bay Area. Sometimes I like to imagine this as like a time-lapse video, the formation of the land and the water moving through it, the rise of the cities and structures that we built and one day, the eventual destruction of them, the disintegration. And so returning to this present moment, what the bay looks like now, what is it like now to look at it or think about it? Is it as permanent or solid as we think it is? will come next. It's our relationship to the things that are here now, knowing that they haven't always been this way and they won't be the way that they are now. So let's check this out a little bit deeper. I'm shifting from the visualization of the Bay Area now to thinking about something that's happening in your life that might be difficult. Maybe it's a relationship, maybe a situation at work, maybe a just difficult emotion. Just bringing the awareness to a headline of something that you might be struggling with right now. Not getting lost in the story, just calling to mind this aspect of life that may be difficult. And just like we were looking at the bay as it is now, notice how you may be seeing this difficult person or situation or emotion as solid and independent, something that's fixed. And how accurate is that view? Knowing that whatever it is that's causing this discomfort or unpleasantness for you is based on causes and conditions that led up to that. It will shift and change. And not to negate the difficulty, but just to call to mind that it is interdependent of things that came before it, maybe even things that we may have put into motion, how we might be reacting to it. And as you sit with this reflection, just notice how this object or feeling might be changing, how it might be impermanent, noticing the interconnection of all of the different causes and connections that, and conditions that have led you into this moment.
And then how can this view, this right view of interdependence and impermanence, the shifting and changing, how might this allow room for a skillful response? Maybe it opens the door for compassion. Maybe it helps clarify how you're perceiving what's happening with this relationship or this emotion. He's calling to mind the ultimate view of reality, all things being connected and impermanent. Does it help shift or shape how you're relating to this difficulty? As we come to an end of this practice, letting go of any visualizations or thought forms. If you had your eyes closed, perhaps returning to open eyes now. So I'd love to hear what that was like for you, um, what the visualization of the impermanence of the bay, how this may relate to difficulty in your life, kind of cultivating this broader view of what's happening. So we'll open it up either in the chat or in person to share. Uh, this can also include difficulty with either the visualization. Oh. I can share, Tig. I don't know if you can hear me well. Yeah. Um, and this is, I, I was really enjoying that part about the bay and, you know, seeing it filling in and filling out. And then I had this just funny moment. And I don't know, this is for anyone who's been to the Salesforce park that has opened they, it's planted like a botanical garden. It's planted with redwood trees. And I can't help but think that, you know, what would that look like in a hundred years if those redwood trees grow to be as big as the buildings? And then this, that was just like what, you know, this future of this like tangled metal and trees and things growing. Um, and then had this like super futuristic view of it just like toppled over and people, you know, I felt I was in like a futuristic movie in my mind. <laughs> um, and there was this, I kind of expected to feel sad about seeing things kind of like tumbled away and destructed and it wasn't, there was actually this just like, it's the flow of, you know, the flow of impermanence is something to kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of swim with and be with rather than try to fight. Mm -hmm. And this, this world might not look anything like it. There might not even be people left on it, right? But like the planet will still be here <laughs> and these trees. And I don't know, I've kind of like lost track of my thought that I wanted to share, but this, what kind of pulled back in was just this idea of always just being in the flow and trying to be really fluid rather than static or, you know, like holding on too tight to things not to change. 
And that's really the practice is staying in that, just staying in that fluidity and allowing that impermanence to just be something being, that's what we're kind of swimming in more so than anything else. So, right. and, and, and that was very grounding in a weird way, <laughs> you know, like, okay, I can swim with this and be in this impermanence and realize like this in a hundred years, 200 years, 1000 years, 1 million years is not going to look anything what it looks like right now. Mm -hmm. And, and it felt okay. Right. And so it just kind of also felt like this, I can deal with whatever like kind of change or adversity floats through my world because that's also not going to necessarily destroy me. Right. It's I'll still be here and I can just keep, keep on keeping on. Yeah. That's <laughs> you, Kim. And I love the, I love the analogy of the swimming. I think that's brilliant. And my question to you would be, how do you feel about that, that Salesforce park now? I think I, it's funny because I, I find it so amusing and I, I kind of want to go and see if the trees have gotten any taller since the last time I was there. <laughs> and this, um, yeah, I guess the part that sticks out to me is that is when I walked around that Salesforce tower, I was like, did anybody think about a hundred years from now <laughs> what this is going to be like? And that if, uh, my feeling was like, has anyone thought of that? And did they just not care, <laughs> right? <laughs> or did they, you know, is it, is there more to it than I realize? And I don't need to be looking at those small details, you know? So, yeah. What I love about that is it kind of moves forward into the action component of what we've been talking about tonight, the view meditation, and then thinking about what happens a hundred years from now. And then is there a wise action that we take around that or that, that we can have in terms of our relationship with the physical world around us. So thank you for, for sharing that. And I like that you were saying too, that there, you know, there was that, that sense of groundedness. And I think that, you know, we see that in the chat, he was sharing, um, sad to imagine the bay changing, but also peaceful to recall the span of time. So there's this kind of like dichotomy um, that there can be difficulty and also grounding and ease at the same time, which I think points back to that ultimate and relative happening simultaneously. So thank you, Kim and Eve for sharing. Anyone else want to share anything that came? Uh, I was going to share. Sure, go ahead. Can you hear? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so this meditation really connected to the other meditation for me. And I think what I wanted to share is I've been feeling a lot of dislocation and a lot of grief about what's happening in the world and has been happening and doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon. So for me, it's a lot of sensitivity and feeling those feelings. And even though the intellectual part of my brain is saying, yes, this will pass and it's impermanent and it could look really different down the road, I am very much just feeling those feelings. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. The end. <laughs> Can yeah. I ask, if, is there, if, if you feel comfortable answering this, um, is there an action that comes out of that feeling, uh, that sadness or that dissatisfaction? Is there a sense of taking action on anything? I mean, I, you know, I'm an activist. I work in prisons. I deal with the CDCR every day. Um, I think I do, I do take tons of action. And the action is feeling very difficult right now. Um, very, very, very difficult. So I've been really trying to find that place to stay motivated, to do what I can um, to be a good person, 
and I'm also holding, you know, a lot of grief about what's happening and a lot of um, a lot of very sensitive feelings coming out of the pandemic and a lot of dislocation. Yeah. Thank you for your work in the world um, and um, for sharing that vulnerability. Um, and I think this what you're also sharing here goes back to what we heard earlier, that things are not always pleasant or easy, um, but that this um, these practices, these teachings can help support us through it. I did hear you say the word motivation. And I think that that's something that's important to help, you know, that that could be the action component of this is the motivation that's driving the work that you're already doing. Um, so thank you for that. <clears throat> Tig, do you want me to read a comment that Eve put in he, the chat box? Oh, you already it. read it. Whoops, I wasn't here. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks, me. Always got the back. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Um, I think that, you know, in as we come to an end of our session tonight, it's really taking some time tonight and the coming days to really think about what is the view that we, what is our stance, what is our perspective, that the lens that we're viewing the world through, what is our aspiration and our intention on, um, on that view, seeing clearly holding both the ultimate and relative at the same time, how does, that in, uh, how does that integrate into our practice? How do we practice with that? Both the formal sitting, but also the informal practice of just being in this relative world. And then how do we come off the cushion and take action? How do we um, kind of bring this trifecta together? Uh, I like to think of the view, meditation and action really is wisdom and compassion. So the wisdom that's cultivated out of the uh, view and the meditation then can lead to this skillful, compassionate response. Um, just gonna take a moment to read. There's one more comment. And so Jonathan in the chat is saying, 100,000 years ago, there was no bay. The current pollution is a result of our collective delusion ego. Humans have a choice if they want to be here with the eternal by purifying themselves. And if they do so, they have a chance to be here in the future physically also. Very powerful. Thank you for sharing that, Jonathan. And I think it really points again to having a choice. This is the view. We have choice and our practice helps open space for that. Um, so thank you for, for illustrating that here in your comment. And um, yeah. So let's end um, with a dedication. Um, so just taking a moment to recall the energy of the session tonight, the practice, the teachings what came up for you, whether it was pleasant or unpleasant. perhaps offering this time together as a Sangha with our inner worlds, offering that to the world, to the suffering, to those that are living in delusion, including ourselves, and that we may be free. We may live with this wisdom and compassion Dedicating this energy to all those that are suffering in this moment, whether they're sick with disease or injury, all of us that are suffering from this delusion of reality. May we all be free. May all beings be free. I'd like to end with this poem from Donna Folds. There is no controlling life. Try corralling a lightning bolt containing a tornado. Dam a stream and it will create a new channel. Resist and the tide will sweep you off your feet. Allow and grace will carry you to higher ground. The only safety lies in letting it all in. The wild and the weak, fear, fantasy, failure and success. When loss rips off the doors of the heart or sadness veils your vision with despair, Practice becomes simply bearing the truth. 
in the choice to let go of your known way of being, the whole world is revealed to your new eyes. So may these teachings and practices support us. May they linger with us throughout the evening and into tomorrow. May all those beings that we come into contact with during this time feel that energy, that wisdom and compassion of our Buddha nature. May all beings be free. Thank you all for practicing with me tonight, for bringing an open mind and an open heart, for sharing, being together. And together, let's follow one more breath deeply into the body. And as we exhale, letting go of the air, letting go of this evening together, beginning to transition into the next moments of life. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I will be teaching um, at the SFDC a bit more regularly. So I'll be teaching the Mandala Meditation course on Thursday night at seven o'clock. Um, TBD on when the start date for that will be, but very soon. Um, so that is a combination of art making and meditation, um, more focused on the practice and the process rather than the end result. So no artistic skill required. I'll also be teaching a contemplative art all day retreat um, coming up and also a uh, meditation all day retreat focused on wisdom and compassion. Um, you can follow me on Instagram and see my art. It's illustrated underscore intentions. My website is tablemalley.com. Thank you all.